Cause like a winter Today we're going to be exploring the world of vintage Hollywood. We are. We have Ginger Polly with us and Manny Pacheco. Manny Pacheco is the co-hosting co today. He is the host of Forgotten Hollywood on TherapyCable.com. He's also written two books on Forgotten Hollywood. Welcome to the show, Manny. Well, you just keep bringing me back. I just, I'm just going to keep coming by. <laughs> we love having you and here. And the topic is fabulous, too. It is. <laughs> Thank you. We're going back in time. With us today is Ginger Polly. Hello. With dozens of appearances on screen, she's a movie actress as well as a singer. Ginger Polly is the it girl for any kind of role, from vintage noir to modern comedy and everything in between. The camera just loves her classic American sweetheart look. Aww. She is also the founder and <laughs> band leader of the jazz band Ginger and the Hoosier Daddies, which brings the music of the 1920s to 40s to life. She also performs as a guest vocalist and as a solo act, as well as charming audiences with her spot-on Helen Kane boop a oh, boop Boop, 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 There you go. <laughs> Numbers complete with feather boa and fluttering eyelashes. Let's welcome Miss Polly to the circle. Welcome Holy the circle. moly. <laughs> wow, that was hard. All right. All right. Wow, she, me, uh, she really got that right, too, because calling herself the It Girl, I mean, that harkens back to the Clara Bow days. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's and let me show you a little <laughs> clip of uh, what Ginger's up to these days. The government has released this public service announcement to promote the Nick Cage terror alert system. Okay, class, when you see Nicholas Cage. And we're even using Nick Cage in the classroom. Ready? For safety. Go! Not the beast! Ah! Enjoy that as much as I did. It's so much fun. I can't wait to see more about that. So, Ginger, let's get cracking on this. Where are you from? I'm from Northern California, um, from a small town called Sonora, not Sonoma, um, although they do have a nice wine country. <laughs> um, and I did a lot, a lot of theater growing up, so that's kind of how I fell into a lot of this. Now, what made you pick this era? Well, I kind of fell into that, too. Um, I moved down to L.A., to Los Angeles. Uh, my aunt lived down here. And... Um, because of my theater background, I was very interested. I knew that I was eventually going to be in Los Angeles. So I got a job at Universal Studios playing Betty Boop. Did you really? <laughs> <laughs> and they had this band out there, and the band was playing jazz music. And one of the band um, guys came up to me one day, and he said, I'm playing this music, this 1920s music, with this band. You should, you should sing with them. And I said, well, tell that band leader, give me a call if you ever need a singer. Well, about a year went by, and I get this call from this band leader, and he says, I have this 1920s band, would you be interested in singing with us? And I went, okay, always say yes, right? <laughs> right, yes. Okay. So I went down and down to Orange County, where he was based, and listened to his, his CDs, and he also had a 40s band, and he said, do you want to go to Spokane next week for a jazz festival? And I went, okay, <laughs> why not? <laughs> And the rest is history, really. Um, a lot of the, the fellas that I worked with at Universal Studios are in my band now, Ginger and the Hoosier Daddies. Ginger and um, I just kind of fell into it, as you do with jazz. <laughs> and did you know much about that time frame? I mean, was there a passion before you got started? Um, definitely. I've always been interested in vintage, and, and my, my mother, my grandmother, and my great aunts taught me how to be a picker. They used to teach me, they used to take me to, um, to vintage sales, garage sales, estate uh -huh. sales, and I really developed an eye for knowing when things were from. I mean, I could pick up something and go, this is 30s, this is 40s, this is 50s, you know, and it just kind of developed. It just was kind of a gift that I got from my, from my aunts and my, <laughs> and, you, and you have a, you have a nickname too, which, um, when we talk about Hollywood's golden age, we don't ever think of that, the terminology but you seem to capture it as your own. The vintage girl, vintage. 
Right. I love that. Thank you. It kind of covers all of the eras that I'm interested in, which is 1900s through 1960s. My interest kind of stops at late 60s <laughs> when we start to get into hippies with long hair and crazy clothes. Because <laughs> I like the classic dressed, put together, neat. I mean, we all miss that men and women dressed like ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. I'm actually kind of excited. It seems about the Great Gatsby. Things are starting to change. The youth are starting to wear more suits. And ties and stuff like that, which is kind of a nice uh, difference. Randy? Well, you know, I, you are very similar to what Michael Bublé and Michael Feinstein, of course, with his work with the Library of Congress and uh, Harry Connick Jr., you're really trying to keep the standards and uh, the, the music of the standards and, of course, Hollywood alive. Tell us a little bit about your reasoning behind that. Definitely. Um, when I first started singing with uh, the twenties band, he was recreating a lot of the old standards. So the Helen Kane music, the who, who was the original Betty Boop, "I Want to Be Loved by You," he gave me the original recordings as well as his band's recordings, and he said, "We're going for the earlier stuff. We want to really try to recreate the originals." And we would do sets with the band where they played the old version, and the band faded into which was really, really fun because I really had to, as an actor and a singer, I really had to do my research to try to sound like Helen Kane, to try to sound like Blanche Calloway, you know. And, and singing. And Ed Henshaw and all yeah. the, exactly. So it was really, really a fun challenge for me. And you, I, I imagine you're a big fan of Hollywood's movies and the Golden Age. Definitely. Age-up. The studio <laughs> era, we used to call that. Definitely. Back when AMC was actually... Vintage movies. American <laughs> movie as a kid, I used to just watch. My parents gave me a TV in my bedroom. I don't know why. At the age of ten, I was watching those <laughs> old movies. You know, every day I was watching those all the '30s movies and the '40s movies and the silent movies, and and I just, I just loved them. I just fell in love with them, probably because it was at an early age. Now what kind of crowd is, is is watching that stuff now or listening to your kind of music? What kind of an audience is it? Sixty plus? Is it everybody now? It's a lot of older folks, but a lot of younger folks too are really starting to become interested. It's all on your Facebook. You actually have quite a bit of followers, and a lot of people. But they're are all ages. Them. They're yeah. all ages. They're not just your grandparents or your parents. I mean, they're they're younger kids. I have this young kid who is fourteen who contacted me after he saw my reel for Vintage America with Ginger. And he said, I'm restoring a car, a 1950s car, with my grandfather, my father, my great-grandfather. There's four oh, really? generations, wow. and he's 14, who are recreating and building this 1950s car. I mean, kids are interested <laughs> in this stuff. Well, because we're on Therapy Cable. I mean, the, the psychology of being able to uh, put together generations of people... Talk about the importance and the value in that. There's got to there's got to be a wonderful value in because I know that when I wrote my books, I I, I dedicated my my forgotten Hollywood books to my grandmother mm-hmm. because we were able to watch Turner Classic Movies together, oh, even though she was house so ridden, and even though she may have liked a different genre. I liked uh, I liked more of those women's pictures. I like <laughs> I like Claude Rains and Betty Davis. She liked. The, the King Kong and the Mighty Joe Youngs. But mm-hmm. whatever movie we saw, all of a sudden, 45 years would disappear. And mm-hmm. the, the conversation proved very valuable for her. Can you tell us a little bit about that psychology? It's true. It really is true. I mean, a lot of, I think a lot of our, our older parents and our grandparents who grew up with that are very anxious to pass it on. Mm-hmm. You know, those of us that have grandparents or older parents who, who appreciate the vintage time and the, yeah. the old movies and, and everything and they're they're anxious to 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 share with us the big connection the big really connection it really is i mean i'm very grateful that my my grandmother and my great aunts passed on you know where yeah. they were from my my great my grandparents my great grandparents on my mother's side um, came here in the 30s from Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl. I mean, the Grapes of Wrath is their story, oh, <laughs> pretty wow. much. So, I mean, my grandmother has written a book about coming over here and everything That's they really. had to go through and why they do things the way they do, why she washes clothes the way she does, why yeah. she why she irons the sheets. <laughs> why, I mean, you know, just crazy stuff that we go, what? You know, but it made sense the for them. The clothesline. <laughs> yeah, and how to put the glasses <laughs> upside down so that they in the cupboard so they wouldn't get dusty. Oh, yeah. You know, where does that come from? That. That, came, that came from back then, you know? So it's just, it's just fascinating. 
Has your grandmother seen you sing? Or oh, you yeah. Okay. Yeah, my family's been really, really supportive. I can and imagine. they've seen the band, and they love it. That's fantastic. <laughs> well, what are some of the songs you sing? Tell us about the, the, oh, the music. Oh, gosh. Well, my band um, is kind of a combination of the other two bands that I originally started, the 20s and the 30s and 40s. So the 20s band that I originally sang with is a 12-piece, and the, the 40s, 50s band is 15 pieces. And it's really, 15. really hard. I know. Wow. It's really, really hard to get to book yeah. a, a big band like that. Nobody <laughs> wants to pay that much money for a 15-piece band. So I thought, you know what? I can bring in the guys that play in both bands. They can both play both styles. You know, the 20s and 40s is pretty different as far as styles go. One is a 4-4, four, four, one is a 2-2. Two, two. So... <laughs> so I was able to pull the guys from both bands, make my own band into a seven piece. It's a lot cheaper to hire us. That's a smart. And go move. all over the place. I like it. And it's all that. my own music. So very cool. Well, so what cool. you're telling us is that some of these uh, tunes that you sing are originals. Some well, I do all cover songs. Um, not meaning my music, meaning my versions of oh your arrangements, uh, right? Your arrangements. I get that. Okay. Right. And I, like I said, I try to stick to the originals, but I have somebody who will rewrite music for me and um, make it work for my band, writing out, you know, a, a chart for seven pieces. Like, for example, do you know who Danny Polo is? He did a lot of, a lot of uh, music in the 1920s. Okay. And a song that was written in 1913, which is also on my album called Hitchiku, there wasn't really <laughs> an arrangement for a band out there. And Danny Pola's version is an instrumental. And when I was growing up in Northern California, I sang it in a show. It's a cute little song called Kichiku. It's written in 1913. So I wanted an arrangement of this song that sounded kind of like Danny Polo's because he had this great bass solo that was really, really fantastic. And so I called my guy and I'm like, can you do this for me? Put it, make it for my band. Put in the bass solo and the vocal. And he's like, yeah, I can do that. So it's on my CD. <laughs> And you're going to hear that anyway, at the end of the show as well. <laughs> the creativity that you're able to, to bring together with other people that, that know the music and, and can help you recreate that, it's just, it's so exciting. It's so much fun. <laughs> is, is, it, fun. is it hard to find the collaborative process of folks who are interested in this style of music? It can be, but not if you know where to look. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where do you look? <laughs> well, I've been really fortunate to be able to work with a lot of different bands, and um, Dean Mora does a lot of my arranging. He's a big band leader here in California, in Southern California, Northern California, and he's got a band called Dean Mora, Dean Mora's Modern Rhythms. And he's he's really great at helping people collaborate and, and put their arrangements together. And That's it's cool. fun to hear it for the first time, though. Well, you mean the first time you get like the one with uh, Danny Polo? Well, no, I mean the first time you get your arrangement back. You know, when, when Dean sends me the arrangement and says, here it is, I go to the band and we play it for the first time. It's just like... <laughs> wow. This is what I had in mind. Yeah, oh my gosh, that's exactly there it is. It. Uh, that's cool. Hi, welcome to Adelante. This is Adelante Recovery, and my name is Yvette Kuglin, and I'm part of the staff. Adelante Recovery Center has helped people in dual diagnosis for five years. We accept most PPO insurances and provide luxury accommodations and 24-hour support. To speak with an admissions counselor, call 1-888-242-4450. A lot of time, we don't even know what's wrong with us, and sometimes we need to get away to figure that out. So if you want to go for a little retreat out in Corona Del Mar, which is a confidential location, we're here to help. So... We're only a phone call away. Thank you. Well, let me, uh, let's see, we're exploring a little bit in the upcoming months, woman, right? We're looking at the story of woman. So with you, I wanted to ask you the question, what's your impression of today's woman? And maybe give us a comparison, if you can, of the 1920s or 1930s woman. You have some exposure, obviously, with personal experience with your grandmother and, yeah. uh, and uh, anything else that you've studied or been exposed to. So what's your impression of today's woman? What is today's woman? I think today's woman, when, I, when you say today's woman, I think of how we dress. 
How are you dressed? Interesting. Um, and do we act ladylike? What do you think? <laughs> I, think yes, do. I think some of us do. I think some of us do. I think some of us could be a little more educated when it comes to how to how to act and how to be a lady. You know? Are you, do you think we're missing some of that glamour that, that maybe Grace Kelly or Audrey Hepburn oh, brought to the table? Definitely. And there's definitely a nostalgia to bring that back. You can see it with, with all of the, the different people um, recreating vintage designs vintage clothes and the men too the yeah. men too i can tell that with the suits now getting all tighter fits and the looks of the 1920s and 30s smaller ties yeah with the pink hats exactly <laughs> maybe yeah. ties. even hats bow ties i've seen that a lot more the fedoras love it. Right. and the chance to dress up and go out and, and there's places around here there's places like downtown los angeles like the cicada club places you can go out oh, to yeah. a supper club and dance and hear a live band you know there are places like that still around i mean do you think that that brings back a certain decorum, a certain, uh, that style is, is maybe the way to go to hone in the rebellious nature of what the Just United States, <laughs> what the United States is offering these days? Do you think that that might be a good thing to do? I think it's about education. Yeah. You know, I think that getting the word out and showing people what's classy and, and educating them because a lot of people just aren't educated about it and they just go out of the house in sweats, not really thinking, looking in the mirror and going, huh, how am I presenting myself today? Not, not what, do I, what do I look like to other people, like not worrying about what other people think of you, but how am I presenting myself today? What do I want to do with my life? That's a good point. I think about that. <laughs> <laughs> you think women are different back in the 1930s or 40s? They also have more. Do you think they have more respect for themselves, or is that kind of hard? That to... might be it, but I think it's also. I think you have to find a res when you find a respect for yourself, you also find respect for others. Interesting. And I see that a lot. Fortunately, living in LA, <laughs> the way people drive, you know, people just don't. They're very selfish, <laughs> yeah. you know. And I think that more people did respect themselves. They do find a respect for others. And a lot of it is education, too. But you, might, were brought up. but you would probably have to agree that the, the value of feminism is also a good thing, too. The idea of being empowered as a woman. I oh, think that's important, too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And you notice, too, when you start to learn how to dress and, and, you know, you just feel more confident and better about yourself, you know, if you know how to dress and put together an outfit. And it's fun. That is fun. Now, mm -hmm. what's your advice you would give to the young woman of today? If we had... Yeah, an audience of 16, 18 year old who are trying to find themselves, trying to get into what's life all about. What would Ginger Polly say to them be one of the things that you would recommend for them? Find out what interests you and go for it. That's good. It's a very educational way of, of, of looking at things. The idea of first knowing where to go, achieving that goal, and we talked about this off camera, not learning to say no to things, mm -hmm. Try, going for Just it. Just say yes. Yeah, say yes. I mean, you know, maybe you might decide that or figure out that it's not what you want to do. Okay, then do something else. But, okay. you know, if you have a passion for something, do it. Go for it. Be yourself. Do it. So, Ginger, we have a fastball question that's coming up in a couple of minutes here. <laughs> <laughs> Manny's been exposed to it as well. He handled uh -oh. it well. Uh, but before we get to that, you're working on something, uh, a new show or something? I am. What's I that am, all about? I'm working on pitching a show to networks, and it's called Vintage America with Ginger, and it's all about vintage cool. America, vintage businesses, um, people that are doing vintage things, or people that dress vintage, or people that recreate vintage clothing, or people that are recreating their vintage cars, or doing something vintage, or what a historic place was and what it is now. If it still exists. Right. Or what it used to be. And the passion for it. Right. There's a huge, huge following right now for vintage things. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Actually, you mentioned earlier that the vintage gas station was saved by... Uh, That's right. This, today, actually, is supposed to open the... Um, there's a gas station on Willoughby and Highland. And, in, um, in Hollywood. In Hollywood. And it's it, a Starbucks has bought it. Starbucks. And <laughs> they, they're recreating it, and they're, they're turning it into a Starbucks. You know, Starbucks. It was a national, or is it? It's a, it was a historical monument, so they can't tear it down. But Starbucks found it and decided to to use it. I mean, that's exactly <laughs> that's, cool. that's exactly what we're talking about. You know, and it's fun and it's exciting. As an advocate for all things nostalgia and vintage, do you think that we can? Uh, uh, I, I think that there's a market out there for that. Obviously, 
because I've got the forgotten Hollywood journey and franchise and you've got the vintage girl uh, idea and franchise and becoming a, a market. Do you think that we can, we, we can actually tap into something that you think is a, uh, that can turn into a, a tsunami of, of, of interest? Absolutely. <laughs> I think we've got a lot of people that are interested in vintage and who all do different things. And I think by, by working together, like for example, me, you know, doing my show and bringing on vintage people, you doing this show and bringing us on, you know, it, it new stirs up the interest and, and brings other people that do other things forward. I can't tell you how many people that come to me and go, I do this, I do this, I do this, man, get me on your show, da, 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 you know. Before you before you ask your fastball question, I do have oh, yeah, one. Sure. I do have a real important question. I had the pleasure this year of meeting David McCullough and oh, uh, wow. and and uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, and oh, they wow. both said to a person, they said the exact same thing. What are we going to do one hundred years from now when we don't have those letters that were written? the way they were written in the 1920s and the 1930s or maybe in the, uh, the 19th century, mm -hmm. uh, when, when people are now uh, just tweeting or they're just uh, writing emails and, and they're so disposable and they disappear. Do you think that that might make uh, the idea of vintage and nostalgia a little harder to convey 50 years from now or 100 years from now? Because that was a real concern. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we preserving these letters? Are we preserving... Tweets and emails. You know, yeah. Well, I mean, preserving them, like putting them, um, taking pictures of them, or, or preserving them in some way. Well, you I mean, you mean the vintage letters, or you mean the yes? Yeah, I, I'm assuming we are. Well, we are from the 1900s, but I'm saying in 2012. You go, you fast forward 50 years from now. Well, what was said in 20 What do we have to give? What do we have to contribute? Generation. Now, I know that the Library of Congress was very forward thinking, and the idea that they are now saving all tweets. Oh I mean, no! Can you believe that? So you got to be careful what you what you put together in the 146 characters. Careful what you tweet to Library of Congress. <laughs> well, no, no, no. They, 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 they're garnering right right back. You, know, like, you, you don't have to. You actually oh. don't have to send them to the Library of Congress. Wow. They're just garnering. They're, they're showing. Just, wow. they're I would showing. like to be the guy to sift through that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, fastball question. Are you ready? I guess so. All right. All right. Okay. We got two partner for you. Doesn't happen very often. We have a two part. Favorite singer of the 1920s, 30s, or 40s? Oh boy. Oh, and I already get asked this. I just. Oh gosh. Um, and she had a lead. I know. It's kind of a toss up <laughs> between Helen Kane and, and Annette Henshaw, I think, just because um, they're both people that I can identify with as, as a performer, not just a singer. Interesting. You know, but also Doris Day. Uh, you know, who is also a, a band singer, a big band singer, and an actress. Was she really? Yeah, she was discovered by Jack Carson. Mm -hmm. I she was a big band singer. Yeah. And the tough question here goes: last basketball question. Uh, if you could go back in time, we asked you this before. Yeah, you asked me. I remember <laughs> that. I know that. I know the question that's coming. Uh -huh. <laughs> go back in time. Which male actor would you like to do with a date on? On a date with? There you go. Humphrey Bogart. Humphrey Bogart <laughs> or Cary Grant. Oh, oh, I like that answer. That's a great answer. So that tells charming. a lot about Ginger. He's just so charming and, and just such a gentleman. And in real life, you know, he was a yachtsman and yachtsman. he loved boats. Very adventurous. Oh, very different from the persona that he conveyed on screen. Mm -hmm. How fascinating is that? <laughs> all right, Ginger, people are going to want to get a hold of you. Where do we go? Uh, you can go. I'm all over the internet. Um, I'm on. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm, big, I'm, pretty big, I'm pretty big and I'm getting better at social networking. Um, I'm on Facebook, um, Ginger Polly. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Pinterest. I'm on Instagram. Um, my website, which is gingerpolly.com, you can send me a message. I don't have 5,000 friends yet on Facebook, so feel free to add me. Send me a message. If you're interested in vintage, please, please, please send me a message. I would love to know who you are. Um, and my my show, which I'm pitching, um, Vintage America with Ginger, is on our sizzle reel is on YouTube, and we are currently looking for a network. So if anybody knows a network that might be interested <laughs> in a vintage show, please let us know. Or a <laughs> this cable got, channel. Yeah. Exactly. Right. This has got This has got to get out because it's just so much fun. It needs to be done. Absolutely, we can catch the sizzle reel right after the show. If you want to see it, about three or four minutes. You don't want to miss it. 
Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Carlos. Thank you very much. Manny, always a pleasure. It, it's been fun. And I got to tell you, this has been absolutely uh, an eye opener to know that uh, somebody so young and so vibrant <laughs> is still promoting Hollywood's golden age and the vintage lifestyle. I, I love that. I am very passionate about it. How you can tell. <laughs> Ginger Polly, smart, talented, and beautiful. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching the show. Remember, our motto is simple. Wherever the psychology involved, no matter how far back in time we go, 1920s or not, we're going to be there. We'll see you next time. Circle of Insight on TherapyCable.com.